Our first reading today may be puzzling. Amos, prophet from the south, lived in the north, speaks to those in Zion, those who live in Judah, the southern part of the kingdom. At this time, the northern part of the kingdom had been decimated. Ten out of the twelve tribes had been uh, attacked, and some were carried off into exile. Many, 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 many were killed. And Amos speaks to the wealthy in the south, and he says, you don't even care. You don't even care that your brothers and sisters up in the north have been devastated. You drink your bowls of wine. Can you imagine that a glass isn't enough? You got to have a bowl? Wow, that's a thirsty person. <laughs> you lay on your bed of ivory. Gosh, I can't even imagine what that would look like. You can't even import ivory into the United States anymore because of, of the over uh, the over hunting of places where uh, elephants with tusks uh, exist. And you have the finest oils and the finest perfumes and all these kinds of things and you totally ignore what's going on in the north. And then he prophesies when your time comes, you will be exiled. And when the Babylonians come, the wealthy of the south are the first to be exiled. And Jesus tells us this parable. Sometimes I wonder if it's a parable or if he really just knew about Lazarus and the rich man. It's listed as a parable in the gospel. Maybe it's a real story that he knew about. I don't know, but it's a familiar story. The rich man, he has everything he needs. He's got those bowls of wine and the perfumes and the ivory, ivory couches and all these kinds of things. And Lazarus is there at the door. And he's very impoverished. He's sick probably because he has these, these wounds that the dogs lick. He's there at the door, so that means that every time the rich man goes to and from his house, he has to step over him. Steps over him. It's like he doesn't even see that he's there. And he longed to eat scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Rich man isn't named in the gospel. Lazarus is. Rich man is not named. And they both die. And it says that the rich man is buried and Lazarus is carried off to a place of comfort in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man is buried. St. John Chrysostom said he was buried in the pleasures of the flesh. That's what killed his soul. The bowls of wine, the perfume, the the uh, money, all the things that he had, ivory couches and all these kinds of things. He's buried in these things and it kills the soul. And so they appear in this place and some believe it's Sheol, which is a Jewish belief about the afterlife that the bosom of Abraham is the best place to be in the afterlife, but it's the same Sheol that the rich man is in. So there's a place of comfort and a place of pain, and there's no crossing over. There's rivers and chasms and so forth between the two that no, no one can pass over. Is it an allusion to purgatory? Might be. It might be because the rich man is able to communicate with the righteous, which would never happen in hell. So we don't know. We'll find out someday. Rich man is there and he sees Lazarus 
in his place of comfort. And he's still selfish and self-centered. Abraham, he finally sees Lazarus and he knows his name. Send Lazarus to tip the dip of tip the the to, to place the tip of his finger in water and touch my tongue to cool it. Because I've had all these sumptuous foods and all these things that have buried me, that have caused death of my soul, and it will cool my tongue. Essentially, he's oh, Lazarus, he's he, in this place of pain. He's still a servant to me. He still hasn't lost that self-centered. It hasn't been burned away yet. And Abraham says, no, there's no crossing over. He had a tough life. And now he's being comforted. Whereas you had all the pleasures of life, yet you didn't see Lazarus at your door. You stepped over him and you didn't make provision for someone like him who was poor and you had all these things. You enjoyed all these things. And he says, oh, send, send um, <clears throat> someone, would be somebody from the dead, right? He's talking to the righteous who have died. Send someone to warn my five brothers. And that could be symbolic of the five senses that he gave into when he was buried by these pleasures of the flesh. But send somebody to warn my five brothers that they don't wind up in this place. And Abraham says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. No, 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 send somebody that's, you know, somebody from the dead to speak to them. He says, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, like the prophet Amos, they won't listen to someone even if he should rise from the dead. We, we live in a world today where, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, they're out there in the world, they're in my family. Big deal. And you're like, has anyone else done that? Do you know anybody else who's, who's risen from the dead to come back to tell us, hey, this is the way, this is the truth, this is the life. But so many people are indifferent, just like the rich man, so indifferent to the one that rose from the dead to bring us life, to tell us, hey, what the world is telling you will, will enhance and bless your life is actually going to cause death of the soul. You will do all these things that the world says to do to make you happy, and you will find yourself unhappy and spiritually dead. Today we're reminded, as we were last week, to make provision for the poor. I'm probably speaking to the choir because last week we had the fundraiser for the Aid to Women Center. And, you know, I, I got there late because I had the 5 p.m. mass and then I, I needed to talk to Kevin Saunders afterwards and a few more things. And then I got kind of lost on the way over there. Uh, and they, it was on my calendar where it was, but it's one address and it's like there's a zillion buildings and I'm walking around asking people, do you know where the Aid to Women Center uh, gala is? Oh, we think it's over here. So I finally found it. And by the time I found it, everybody had eaten, even the dessert. And you're like, you feel bad, but it's like, I'm starving. And it's like, tch, 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 tch. and you, when I had a chance to take a breath and look around, I'm sitting at the table with St. Timmers. And I look around, right? And we had this incredible speaker, Abby Johnson. I mean, incredible speaker. And I look around just from my, and there's dozens of tables. I look around. There's some St. Tim's people. There's some St. Tim's people. There's some St. Tim's. There's some over here. And you're like, this parish is awesome. These people have a commitment 
to life, which is, I believe, also a way of standing in solidarity with the poor. But each of us, each of us need to make a commitment to the poor in order to live the Christian life. Bishop Barron said that he heard a speech that Cardinal George, who ordained me a deacon, uh, said to the people of Chicago, the wealthy people of Chicago, when they, he was, there was some sort of a fundraiser or something like that, and he said, you folks, the poor need you folks to alleviate their poverty, to help them out of their poverty. And you folks need the poor to keep you out of hell. And you're like, whoa, what a statement. What a statement. I mean, you look at the rich man. And you're like, well, I'm not rich. You know, somebody said something to me a long time ago. And it's stuck with me ever since. We went to this parish, went to on pilgrimage to uh, see the tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And this was, I believe, in 1997. Some of the people that went have gone on to the Lord. Some of them are still here. And we had a couple of tour guides. One of them was, her name was Sandy, wonderful lady. And one of the families brought her to the United States for a visit. This is before I went in the seminary. So uh, I visited with her, and we're driving around, and I think it was summertime, and she said, where are all the people? I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, you know, walking around. I said, well, it's hot, and, you know, they're in their air-conditioned houses. And she said, oh, in Mexico, only the rich people have air conditioning. And when she said that, I stepped back and thought, in the eyes of God, because I have this particular comfort and many others, am I considered rich? It's made me think. It's also prompted a commitment to the poor. All of us are called to a commitment to the poor. Maybe we're on fixed income and we, we can't do a lot, but you can volunteer for St. Vincent de Paul right here in the parish and be a minister in that, that particular um, apostolate and serve the poor. Another thing that we can do, and Father Charlie has said this and Bishop Barron said this too. He said, keep some money in your pocket for the Lazaruses of the world. And Father Charlie would say, you know, get some gift cards for maybe McDonald's and keep them with you for the Lazaruses of the world because you're going to encounter them. Now, I, I caution women, right, because sometimes these people that are on the street are, some of them, a lot of them have mental illness. Some of them are criminals. Some of them are legitimately poor and just don't have much, and they need help. But I caution women because if they're alone, it's like you don't want to, put yourself in a compromising situation. I was, just came back from California and I, I fueled up and <clears throat> went into the convenience store and there were some characters outside and you're like, uh, you know, we try to step around them because they did not look like they had the best intentions in the world. Although they might have been begging, I don't know, I think they were. We have to be prudent as well. So sometimes, and I think this is a good commitment, we make commitments to organizations like St. Vincent de Paul. So we are giving to them, and then they take care of those resources and get them to the poor. Friends, we're not living the Christian life if we haven't made provision for the poor. We have to ask ourselves, when we go to our examination of conscience at the end of the day, is somebody better off because I am here? Is somebody better off? We can't, the, the Lord says the poor you will always have with you. But maybe like Mother Teresa, there's this little tiny corner of the world, a little tiny corner that we can make better for somebody else. Friends, today, 
Let us reaffirm our commitment to the poor, and if we have not yet made a commitment, as we receive the Lord, the same Lord who speaks to us in the gospel, let us solidify, let us make and solidify our commitment to the poor.